Welcome to the World Shared Practice Forum. I'm Dr. Adrian Randolph, Senior Associate in Critical Care Medicine at Boston Children's Hospital and Professor of Anesthesia and Pediatrics at Harvard Medical School. We're very pleased to have with us today Dr. Karen Chung. Dr. Chung is a professor in the Department of Pediatrics and Critical Care at McMaster University and in the Department of Health Research Methods, Evidence, and Impact. Her current research is focused on PICU-based rehabilitation and patient-centered outcomes, as well as evaluation of acute rehabilitation practices in pediatric critical care units across Canada. Today, we will be discussing early rehabilitation in the PICU with a focus on the benefits and goals of early mobilization and how it can be achieved in the PICU setting. Dr. Chung, welcome. Thank you very much, Dr. Randolph. I'm going to be talking today about why we should be considering early rehabilitation for our children in the pediatric ICU, what we mean by PICU-based rehabilitation, and how we can operationalize rehabilitation in our critically ill children. The first reason that we should be considering rehabilitation is because the population in our pediatric ICUs is changing. Our focus in the PICU is traditionally on early recognition and resuscitation, stabilization and organ support with the primary objective of saving lives. Once our patient's organ dysfunction has reversed, we're focused on discharging these patients as ours is a high turnover service and there's always a high demand and a shortage of beds. In the last two decades, we've become very good at resuscitation and organ support in critically ill children, such that the mortality rate has dropped significantly and is now at an all-time low. Improvements in survival amongst critically ill children has resulted in a population shift over time. Children admitted into our PICUs today are more complex. The number of children in the PICUs with chronic complex diseases has doubled. These patients now take up more than two-thirds of our PICU population. Children with chronic complex diseases take up the burden of our critical care today. They take up 79% of our PICU days, up to 89% of our invasive therapies, and consume 81% of PICU costs. The mortality has shifted from the PICU period to the post-PICU period. You can see from this data in different regions that our PICU mortality in the first six months after leaving the ICU is just as much or even higher than when they were in the ICU. This post-PICU mortality is due to the population shift. This study from Sweden shows that the risk of mortality is higher over time after you have had repeated admissions compared to one admission. This is further intensified by the presence of a chronic complex condition. So the main risk factors for death in PICU survivors are having a chronic complex condition and repeat admissions to the PICU. Our survivors are our future patients. The next two things that I'd like to talk about with respect to why we should consider rehabilitation in critically ill children is because there's been a rise in PICU-acquired complications and these have impact on our long-term survivor outcomes. There's been a dramatic rise in PICU-acquired complications over the last 10 years. The specific complications that I'm talking about include iatrogenic withdrawal, delirium, and PICU-acquired weakness. You can see that these conditions are no longer uncommon. Ten years ago, only 2% of our children suffered from PICU-acquired weakness. Now up to a quarter of these children develop PICU-acquired weakness. 25% of our children experience some form of delirium, and in fact up to 53% of our mechanically ventilated children experience delirium. 63% of children who have been exposed to sedatives experience some kind of iatrogenic withdrawal. These PICU-acquired complications have significant impact on their patients' outcomes. Each of these problems are independently associated with an increased duration of mechanical ventilation and an increased length of stay. They also affect mortality. There is an increased cost of $10,000 per each day that a child experiences delirium. These pediatric acquired complications not only impact on PICU outcomes, they have a longer lasting effect on these children beyond the PICU. PICU-acquired complications are an independent risk factor for poor long-term functional recovery and have been shown to be associated with increased parental stress. Our survivors are our future patients. 35% of our PICU survivors are readmitted into hospital six months after they're discharged. 
dysfunctional disability has a significant impact on our patients well beyond the PICU. Up to 56% of these children have persistent poor functioning at six months. We now understand that our children suffer not just from functional disability, but a majority of them also experience poor quality of life upon PICU discharge. We now know that critically ill children suffer a multitude of sequelae beyond the original illness that brought them into the pediatric ICU. 93% of these children report poor quality of life following critical illness. You can see that this is significantly higher than the data from 10 years ago. Critical illness results not just in physical sequelae, but also psychological and emotional problems after these children leave the PICU. It has a long-lasting impact on patients and these families. Many parents also experience psychological sequelae. Some of them report post-traumatic stress syndromes, and up to 30% of them actually experience depression. 50% of these parents actually have persistent symptoms beyond a year. Parental stress is very high and remains very high at six months post-discharge. Stress is significantly higher in parents of critically ill children compared to other conditions such as childhood cancer and diabetes. Parental stress is important because it can impact length of stay and in itself influence functional recovery. Poor functional recovery in turn perpetuates parental stress. These phenomena are now known collectively as the post-intensive care syndrome. This has been well reported in the adult population, but we now know that this also exists in children as well as their families. And so the major reason to consider rehabilitation in critically ill children is because our success in pediatric critical care has resulted in improved survival. However, survival is only the beginning. Our patients are sicker and they're more complex. We're now recognizing that there's increasing harm from critical care. We now have an ICU-acquired complication rate that is unacceptable and an in excess of mortality. Critical illness is shifting from an acute to a chronic condition because of the long-term sequelae, which is the post-intensive care syndrome, and a persistent risk of mortality. Survival from the pediatric ICU is now associated with protracted recovery and a risk of recurrent critical illness as well as ICU readmission. And this is the legacy of critical illness. The final reason for considering rehabilitation in the critically ill population is to consider what is important to patients and families. In this survey study, we asked family members and healthcare providers what were the most important outcomes to them if their child was enrolled in a clinical trial. 77.5% of family members and 85% of healthcare providers selected quality of life and functional status after discharge as their priority outcome. Their second choice was organ dysfunction. When we asked parents in a qualitative study what were priority outcomes to them for their critically ill child, most of them reported that health condition indeed is important to them. Parents do want to know about the diagnosis, if there's any treatment for their child, what the prognosis is, as well as if their child is going to survive. But once it is clear that their child is going to survive, they focus on functional recovery and quality of life outcomes. They want to learn about rehabilitation strategies for their child. They also want us to pay attention to ICU environment, and they also need support for their own families. PICU-based rehabilitation may in fact impact on caregiver outcomes. In this study, we looked at factors that may influence parental stress six months following PICU discharge. We found that there was a significant reduction in parental stress scores in those who with home participation strategies, as well as those children who had received PICU-based rehabilitation. This suggests to us that PICU-based intervention may have a downstream effect on the impact of parental stress even after they leave the pediatric ICU. So why should we consider rehabilitation in critically ill children? That is because rehabilitation may reduce harm, that is PICU-acquired complications, and it may improve patient and family-centered outcomes. And mostly, it is because it is important to parents and families. Thank you so much, Karen, for that wonderful overview. Um, it's very fascinating to see this paradigm shift into chronic critical illness. And um, it's, it's really shocking to see the number of readmissions to the ICU and the amount of mortality that's occurring post-ICU discharge. Mm -hmm. Our attention really needs to shift towards looking more in 
deeply at these issues. So now, will you tell us some more about rehabilitation and the process of recovery in the PICU? So rehabilitation is a fairly new concept to the pediatric intensive care unit. PICU rehab is how we in the critical care environment progress from resuscitation and organ support to focusing on a child's recovery. Rehabilitation is the process of recovery. It is about addressing clinician as well as patient and family priorities. It is about organ dysfunction and improving survival, but it is also about addressing quality of life, functioning, changes in the ICU environment that we can implement to improve healing, as well as providing caregiver and family support, because these are the things that are important to patients and families. These multidimensional domains that parents express as important to them is represented by the WHO's framework for defining health, disability, and functioning. This is well known to rehab clinicians, and we are just learning about this paradigm in the pediatric intensive care unit. And so rehabilitation is about bridging survival, with survivorship. Not only is our skill set therefore just about early recognition and resuscitation, it's about early recognition and rehabilitation to optimize our patient's recovery. No longer is it just about saving lives, it's about saving lives with better quality. What do we mean by early PICU-based rehabilitation? Early means prompting us to recognize early what may be harmful and instituting measures for harm prevention. Our typical PICU practice paradigm is that the majority of our patients who are intubated and ventilated are sedated. This leads to a sedation and mobility harm cycle because sedated patients are invariably immobilized. This is further compounded by the fact that the majority of intubated children are infants and toddlers or because of developmental disabilities are nonverbal. There is a perception that movement and wakefulness is interpreted as agitation, and this is bad for the patients. Therefore, agitation is perceived as a need to escalate sedation. These PSU require complications of sedation, immobility, and delirium are therefore not isolated phenomena. They are interrelated. We continue to have a culture of sedation in our PSUs today, and sedation is the key barrier to implementing rehabilitation. We prioritize sedation because our primary safety concern in intubated ventilated patients is accidental extubation. However, we have good evidence from large randomized control trials and systematic reviews that self-extubation rates are actually uncommon and mobility-related adverse events are to the order of 0.4 to 2.5%. So what you're saying is that we need to shift from these short-term um, um, adverse events such as accidental extubation, which by the way many of those patients succeed in, um, be, in remaining extubated, to at, um, defining these adverse events that, are, that occur later in the course, such as um, inability to mobilize and uh, walk and um, some of the other complications that we see later. Mm -hmm. And I'll speak to that a little bit later um, uh, in my presentation. We have a problem reducing sedation because we have conflicting attitudes towards sedation. We understand the side effects of sedation, however, we desire deeper sedation for our patients because we believe it reduces their anxiety and stress. We understand that we, want, we should be reducing sedation, however, we have a perception that reducing sedation may actually increase workload. There continue to be some knowledge gaps with respect to our sedation practices. Most of us are very comfortable with sedation, however, we are uncomfortable with mobilizing critically ill children. We continue to have a lack of understanding of delirium in children, and we have a misconception that sedation equals sleep. There are significant knowledge gaps that remain with delirium. As I mentioned, the majority of us are very comfortable with assessing sedation and withdrawal because we've been doing this for years. However, in the survey study that we conducted, only 14% of respondents were comfortable with delirium assessments. And in fact, 60% of clinicians don't know how. They don't understand the tools because they haven't been trained on how to perform delirium assessments. Many clinicians have a lack of understanding of the impact of delirium and the long-term sequelae that these children may have. There's a continued lack of awareness of risk factors these are benzodiazepine use, depth of sedation, and young age under two years. 
as well as developmental delay. In a study by Deborah Long from Australia, she reported that 38% of clinicians felt that benzodiazepines were actually beneficial for the treatment of delirium. 13% of respondents felt that a urinary catheter can actually reduce delirium. And so 61% of us never or rarely discuss delirium during rounds because it is not prioritized. There are also significant knowledge gaps with respect to sleep in the pediatric intensive care unit. We've now learned that sleep homeostasis plays a critical role in the recovery of critically ill patients. It has a role in immunity, thermoregulation, growth hormone release, as well as the prevention of catabolic state. We also now know that there are physiologic differences during sleep between adults and children. Children with a developing brain need longer periods of restorative sleep, and children spend a greater percentage of their sleep in slow wave and REM sleep compared to adults. Yet sleep is continuously disrupted in the pediatric intensive care unit because of factors in the environment, the nature of their critical illness, psychological and emotional factors, and also the drugs that we use. This disrupted sleep results in agitation, which increases again the risk of delirium. It causes insomnia, and again, this is a vicious cycle. This agitation then prompts further sedation. We have a misconception that benzodiazepines and opioids may actually improve sleep, but in actual fact, benzodiazepines and opioids decrease restorative sleep and increase arousal frequency, further perpetuating this disruptive sleep cycle. Not only is our practice potentially increasing this risk of side effects, our environment is not conducive to healing. There is light pollution in our PICUs. The light is harsh and artificial, which disrupts the day-night rhythm. It is very noisy in our PICUs. The noise levels can be up to 84 and up to even 100 decibels, which is as loud as a power lawnmower. This noise is disruptive and impairs wound healing and it actually activates the sympathetic nervous system. This perpetuates sleep disruption and hormonal dysregulation, increasing the risk of delirium and post-traumatic stress. We're used to practicing clinician-convenient routines. We're used to giving baths early in the morning, doing x-rays at 4.30 in the morning, and labs very early before it's time for children to wake up because it's convenient for us as opposed to what's considered for the patient. These practices in our environment is bad for the staff, it's toxic for the patients, and it's distressing to families. So early rehabilitation is about harm reduction. It's about understanding that sedation, immobility, and delirium are interconnected and can occur as a result of our practices that we institute with the best intentions. We now know the risk factors for PICU-acquired complications, and that is delayed mobilization, increased sedative use, and benzodiazepine exposure. We also know that PICU-acquired complications is, of course, related to organ dysfunction severity. So early rehabilitation is not just about resuscitation and implementing front-end strategies to address organ dysfunction. It's about recognizing the potential for harm early and instituting these back-end strategies earlier such that we think about this before these PICU-acquired complications actually occur. In summary, PICU-based rehabilitation is about harm reduction. We now have evidence that less is more, meaning less immobility, less sedation, and less benzodiazepines may prevent PICU-acquired complications that I was talking about. PICU-based rehabilitation is about non-pharmacological first-line interventions and personalized goal-directed care. You can see in this video that it is possible to allow children to be awake. This is a nonverbal child who, if we did not allow her to wake up by reducing the sedatives, she would not be able to communicate with us. In fact, she was able to sign, and what she's doing there actually is not saying, pull out the tube, she was actually signing, thank you. So how do we operationalize rehabilitation in the PICU? The first is to educate our staff and rethink our safety priorities. The things that we're concerned about, namely unplanned extubation, cardiorespiratory instability, discomfort and anxiety, are important, but actually they are unusual. Unplanned extubation is rare. We should be refocusing our safety priorities to things that are common, 
such as withdrawal, delirium, and weakness. If we are to implement a culture of safety, we should pay attention to these safety priorities and include our efforts to reduce these common PICU-acquired complications. We now know that mobility-based rehabilitation is safe and feasible in critically ill children. We know that it's possible to mobilize children who are intubated and ventilated, as well as patients who are on advanced life support, uh, including ECMO. There's systematic review evidence from adults showing that the adverse event rate is only 2.6%. We now also have systematic review evidence from pediatrics specifically showing that the adverse event rate from mobility is actually low to the order of 0.4%. And in fact, there's no increased adverse events with mobility compared to chest physiotherapy. We know that reducing sedation is also safe from the large cluster randomized control trial that was conducted by Martha Curley, that is the Restore RCT. This was conducted in 31 US PICUs and enrolled over 2,500 patients, demonstrating that nursing-led goal-directed sedation versus usual care is safe there was no increase in sedation-related adverse events with the reduction of sedation. The next recommendation that I have on how to operationalize rehabilitation in the PICU is to empower our clinicians. To do this, we should implement best practice guidelines. There are several practice guidelines available, but two that are published that have been studied from our institution as well as Johns Hopkins. We know that practice guidelines work because they facilitate rehabilitation. Our study looking at the feasibility of implementing these guidelines demonstrated that it enabled early mobilization and increased the mobilization rate from 9.5% to 77%. Guidelines increase the proportion and frequency of mobilization. Moreover, it empowers physiotherapists and occupational therapists, as well as bedside staff, such as the nurses, to mobilize our patients. It also improves unit culture and team communication. So these practice guidelines, the one from Johns Hopkins is called Pick You Up, and yours is called Liberate. Is that Liberate, right? yes. Liberate, yes. And um, you're going to tell us later on in detail in a separate um, training video exactly how to do Liberate. Is that yes, correct? Yes, that's right. I'll speak to you a little bit uh, more in the next few um, slides about what Liberate is and how to implement a bundle and why bundled um, framework to address these complications is so important. We have some evidence that pediatric sedation guidelines may also improve outcomes. This pre and post study by Kyo et al. demonstrated that there was a reduction in the duration of sedative use uh, after implementing guidelines. The RESTORE study also demonstrated that using this nursing-led protocol did result in reduced exposure to sedatives. It resulted in more days awake and calm in patients, and as I mentioned, there was no difference in adverse events. So that's really fascinating because it's a different way of interpreting the RESTORE outcome because it didn't show a difference in the primary outcome, duration of ventilation, but these kids were able to actually be awake be and interacting, awake and, and there was no increase in adverse events. So that's on what proof that we may not need to use as much sedatives uh, as we're currently using. Yes, that's right. And so I'd like to talk now about how to implement rehabilitation through a bundled approach. The reason a bundled approach is important because Rehabilitation is a complex intervention, and these PICU-acquired complications are interrelated, and they are not an isolated phenomenon. Therefore, a single-pronged approach may not be the best way to address these problems collectively. A bundled approach, however, allows us to think about delivering the less is more approach collectively, meaning less immobilization, less sedation depth and duration, and less benzodiazepines together. Applying rehabilitation through an evidence-based bundle of complementary practices prompts us to address these issues collectively. Rehabilitation is about integrating complementary or codependent practices. This bundled approach was first introduced by the Society of Critical Care Medicine ICU Liberation Collaborative. They introduced an ABCDEF bundle, and we expanded this to include G for good nutrition as well as H for humanism. And all this means is that whatever bundle is available, it should be tailored to the specific needs of your pediatric ICU. 
there is growing evidence for the efficacy of rehabilitation bundle in adults. This bundle has been shown to reduce the incidence of delirium and increase mobilization. There is now systematic review evidence suggesting that the higher number of bundle strategies may improve outcomes. And in fact, a recent publication in the Critical Care Medicine in October suggests that there is a dose response. With increasing percentage of bundle compliance, there is an improvement in the length of stay in the ICU, the length of stay in hospital, and in fact, a reduction in mortality. Increasing bundle compliance not just improves in patient-related outcomes in this adult study, it actually improved symptom-related outcomes, such as the duration of mechanical ventilation, the development of coma and delirium, as well as the use of physical restraints. We don't have adequate data yet in pediatrics. However, this is increasingly studied. There are some emerging studies that suggest that implementing a delirium bundle may actually improve the detection of delirium and adding a sedation and early mobilization protocol may actually decrease the rate of delirium. What we know is that rehabilitation is complex, but applying a bundle actually facilitates teamwork. There is increasing evidence that the success of rehabilitation can only th occur through teamwork and that team collaboration facilitates bundle implementation. I think the most important reason to implement rehabilitation in critically ill children is because it is providing patient and family-centered care. And I'd like to show you some evidence of why family engagement is so important with respect to rehabilitation intervention. We have evidence from our functional recovery study that different aspects of function are affected differently. Mobility domain of function improves the quickest, however, the dependence on caregiver responsibility, meaning the child's dependence on their caregiver to provide their care, is slowest to recover. We also have evidence from quality of life data that while the physical and psychological aspects may improve over time, social and peer support actually are slowest to improve, and this is also reflective of the effect that critical illness has on patients and families. I presented earlier that parental stress is very high in critically ill patients and that PICU-based rehabilitation may actually alleviate parental stress. And so family engagement is key to rehabilitation, just as it is for any activity that a child has to participate in, whether it be school or homework. The family is the child's champion, and we know that a positive attitude and family engagement are powerful motivators for patient participation in rehabilitation. I mentioned earlier that rehabilitation is the process of recovery, which means we should be addressing quality of life, the ICU environment, and caregiver and family support. And this is where our H component of the bundle, which is humanism, comes to play. What we mean by humanism is engaging patients in their rehabilitation. These are children after all, and their endpoint for mobilization is not ambulation. Because they are children, we have to be creative in how we engage our children in mobilization, and therefore these include a neurodevelopmental play in using things like music therapy and toys, in fact, to encourage their mobility. So H component is also about having fun. There are adjuncts that we use to rehabilitation in our PICU. We have a pet therapy program, and therefore H is also for hounds. We have in-bed cycle ergometry that may facilitate mobilization, but we can also use regular bicycles and low-tech toys as well as high-tech toys. Humanism is also about creating a healing environment in our pediatric ICU. I talked to you about the toxic uh, noise and light pollution that we experience in many of our PICUs. In our unit, we've implemented a decibel meter so that we can be aware of the noise we also have a lighting policy and quiet time in our pediatric ICU. And in this picture, you can see that this patient, uh, it, it is past her bedtime, which was 9 o'clock, and the lights are down, and we have a night light. You actually can't see from this picture that this patient is actually on high-frequency oscillation. We are now clustering care to be more patient-centered. We've implemented the sleep routines that these patients already have when they are at home. We use sleep adjuncts, such as weighted blankets, to help reduce pharmacological intervention. And we use assisted communications to help these children communicate 
so that they're not as agitated when they're trying to tell us what they need. We use things like PICU diaries, and as I mentioned, pet therapy, which has been shown to calm patients down and reduce the anxiety. Pet therapy is actually not new. It was first implemented by Florence Nightingale. Humanism is about knowing our patient and personalizing their care. We put our patients' names up on their bed spaces because we want to know them as who they are and not just by a, an illness. In our patients' rooms, we have an all-about-me board, and it always surprises me how much the families want us to know about their child. They write about their child, they tell us about who they are, the things that they like, the things that they dislike. They put pictures up so that we can learn about who their child is, which we wouldn't have an opportunity to because they're intubated and ventilated. Humanism is about personalizing care, integrating families, in fact, paying attention to care and quality of life, not just at the beginning of life, but also at the end of life. While we don't have data yet on the effect of rehabilitation on long-term outcomes, we do know that rehabilitation impacts patients and families. We conducted a qualitative study and asked parents and families what their impressions were of early mobilization. And this is what some of the families said when being offered early mobilization. This father said, it made me aware that he's not dying. It seems like he's going to live. Another mother mentioned, you knew there was some physical benefit to it, but for her, it was something to look forward to. Another family member mentioned, emotionally, we don't get much around here, so psychologically, mobilization was so beneficial. And I love this quote, which summarizes it all. It gave me hope. I've been doing some clinical trials for many years, and I've yet to find an intervention that makes patients and families feel this way. Well, thank you, Dr. Chung, for sharing this amazing, rewarding experience of, of developing and um, this rehabilitation um, program that you've been uh, working on. We look forward in your next video to seeing the nuts and bolts of how you actually do this in the PICU. Thank you very much, Dr. Randall.